so the other, so the students would be able to locally run exactly the same thing that we were we were running on our service degraded without making it so that they could just gain the system. Basically. Um, so what's more, so basically, yeah. So so we wanted to. They have all the test cases, and they've got all the results. They can run at any time. They can test their code and see what grade they would get if they submit it. Um, we want the test cases to be transparent. So the problem before is we had. They basically got a pass or a fail, and they have some mysterious errors in why things didn't work. Here we wanted to basically say, um, your code, like the, the, this thing is wrong with your code. You invent, you created a heuristic which failed this property, which it needs to have. Um, your search, your search code fails on this particular map. You can, which is small enough for you to actually run through it by hand and figure out what's going on. Um, yeah, so we, and we wanted it to run locally, and we wanted it to be exactly the same code. Uh, and yeah, we wanted to allow um, basically students to be able to rapidly iterate and see what was going wrong with their code. Um, this also had the advantage that it lightened significantly the load on our servers because the students, what would used to happen is right before the assignments were due, everyone would be trying to submit to these servers to figure out why their code was not working because they stabbed on the last day. Um, <laughs> so we mostly avoided that. So basically, had we in in developing these test cases, we're kind of uh, we noticed that we're basically designing two kinds, roughly two classes of test cases. One, we're kind of trying to catch common implementation bugs. Like we we'd seen a lot of students doing this assignment before. We could see the, the common errors that students would make, and we could design test cases to specifically exercise those errors. So did you you know did they got the order of two steps incorrect in the search on? Um, and then we'd have overall end-to-end -end validation things that would basically see does their algorithm work and you know how well does it work. In certain cases, you you kind of um, basically design you got kind of some creativity where you can design a better or worse solution, like a better or worse um, sort of uh, search. Yeah. I have a question yeah. About this is also about I guess any kind Yeah. To risk creating a situation where students are basically never learning how to write their own test before they go to the university. Yeah. Well, so we do have, we, um, that's an interesting question. Um, to some degree, it's not the goal of our course. Like, we're, we're not trying to teach software engineering at the same time. And we have a lot of people who are coming in with, with sort of little software engineering experience anyway, but they want to learn the, the typical core techniques that they have. So in some sense, we kind of want to make the programming easier rather than making it harder. But we would also like to, for a certain class of students, like our, our test case is not completely entirely comprehensive. So we'd like people to be able to add their test cases. That could even, we could even make that part of the um, course where Brad will mention some of them. Um, test cases are They're totally white box, yeah. Uh, although we do have a, like a hidden shadow set of SKs that we don't tell students about. So we have some way, <laughs> don't tell anyone. This is not, oh. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, this is not going to shoot, right? So, okay. Yeah, so basically, so we have these small test cases, and instead of using those test cases to basically catch students, so previously we had these very small, we have these very small problems that are kind of designed to check for certain bugs. But the students would not get to see those results. Now we give those to the students. They get to see small kind of um, easy to understand cases where their code should work. And they can debug on those small cases, and they kind of get the Pac-Man thing as a reward. So once it's all working, they get to see Pac-Man like beating the ghost, and it's kind of pretty fun. Um, and so basically, if all those small cases work, the Pac-Man case should just work. So that's, that's sort of the prize for finishing the project. Um, and we found out basically in office how to read it into chess cases, as we discovered our, our we weren't um, So two other things we wanted the grade basically to be final unless the students cheated. So whatever they get on the audit thing they run locally, that's their grade unless they've done something bad. So basically if 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 they pass all the tests and they wrote a broken implementation, that's our fault for not having comprehensive test cases. And so we would add more test cases to that. So that that sort of eased things. And then, yeah, we basically wanted the test cases to be possible. So you you either correctly implemented the algorithm or you didn't. Um, 
or these sort of implementation tests. And then there's a second one where we, we sort of have some creativity. We have sort of like partial credit for um, how fast does your Pac-Man solve the game or something. So what does this look like from a student's point of view? So basically, students download just one zip file which contains all the code that they're modifying. So basically, they've got the Pac-Man architecture, and they add bits sort of in, in core places. And the, the grading code is all there, too. And you just run the autograder from the command line. Really simple. And the autograder itself is, is basically a project in, independent. Like, we improved it as we were developing it, but most of the infrastructure project is project independent. And so the projects have got these uh, questions, and each question has got test cases. And each test case has got sort of a, like a, a, it's declared, it's a declared deployment of a test file which specifies how it's testing, um, you know, what tests run, it, how it's testing the student's code. And then an automatically generated solution file would be automatically generated by running our goal solutions through all the tests. And whatever they do is defined as being correct. Um, so what it looks like is sort of a little small, but basically you run Python autograder and then it, it autograts the code in that directory. So what happened here, so basically this is, so you're running Python autograder. Um, so there's, this, there's sort of a section for each question. So let's say question seven. It passed one of these tests, this futuristic one test, but it failed the seventh test, saying, okay, futuristic failed in this ability test. Um, so they're going to go back and try and figure out why that was. And so they get zero out of four. And in this case, you can sort of see under the hood, basically, in, in a test cases directory, there is a, a test file, which has got exactly sort of the map that it tested the Pac-Man on, details of the test here. And then the solution file is what, is what should have been output but was not output by their solution. And so basically they go back and they figure out okay, why. Why was my heuristic failing in this test case? And then when everything works, basically all the test cases process. You have this case here which is basically grading how good their heuristic was to some set of thresholds we have. And then they get a grade up to it. So sort of basically the student's experience is running this repeatedly on the command line. Um, figuring out why tests fail, and then iterating on that. And the online version is exactly, has exactly the same code, just basically displayed in a slightly different fashion. So this is, a, this is a different test case. Here now, it has sort of the output. So they wrote some code. It says, you, your search failed on this specific little ASCII drawing graph. Here's what your solution output. Here is what it should have output. Um, go try and figure out what was wrong. And the student goes and figures out what's wrong. The algorithm, and then and so this is just this is all the same code, and it looks very similar to me. There's a yeah. Um, so this I think this might be related to Derek's question, but yeah. one we do a lot of very similar things in 169, and yeah. one of the differences, and and we by the way inspired by you guys this semester we actually are giving the students essentially full transparent well commented whatever oh, cool. test cases. So when they fail something, they see these specific test code, the expected yeah. output. But one question and I had a difference between doing that, where yeah. they do it themselves, and then submit at the end, versus when they submit. You know, we used to give them a fixed number of attempts mm. to submit online. Yeah. And one reason for that, for limiting the number of attempts, was to avoid having them just sort of reflexively use the autograder as a debugger. Right? Instead of sort of sitting down, thinking about the bug, and trying it themselves, yeah. essentially doing shotgun debugging, making a random change and resubmitting it. Do, do you have a way to check if students are abusing having access to the local autograders, or, or would you care if they were? You know, is that, maybe it's not an issue for you guys, yeah. but you're not trying to teach the software engineering part. But you also want the students to sort of, right. when they see the error, to first think about where the code might be the problem. Right. I mean, so to some extent, that's really kind of a, that's a policy and, and, and pedagogy decision. And the position that ultimately the course staff took for this course was that we were most concerned with them we're most concerned with them learning the AI concepts. Now, granted, if you're sort of doing shotgun debugging where you change something and throw it in again, you know, that, that will impede your AI learning and understanding. Um, but in general, the interest was not in putting a lot of effort on them or a lot of pressure on them to um, really build their debugging and testing skills. We're trying to get focus as much on AI. Because sort of like, like Nick commented earlier, I mean, some of the students coming to this course from CogSci backgrounds or some, I mean, some of the students told me the hardest part of this course for me was Python. Um, and it was, they, they didn't have a, a programming background. Um, and so that's, and that's also actually kind of reflected in, in that we'll have, you know, 
very small test cases that are on you know, very well-defined things. And then sort of stress tests where we run a reference implementation on a much larger problem and check that they did the same thing every step of the way. Mm -hmm. And so in case, sometimes we, we like to try and maintain the property that if you pass the smaller things where it's easier to find your bug, that you implies that you will pass the big things. Um, and so when we when that breaks down, then it's sort of our fault that we release new smaller tests. Got it. That's great. But if a student trying to like over that's then their situation Yeah, so I mean, pretty much the only way to overfit these would be to like hard code the solution. Right. And we'll we'll cover that. If you do something that is a reasonable, good faith, correct answer, it right. should pass. There's also, I mean, and, and there's kind of two orthogonal things here. One is having modular declaratively specified tests, test cases. And the other one is giving the students the code to run it. So we, you could just have the online version and then gate how many times they could submit it there if you if you were worried about that. Um, and still have relatively clear test cases say like here is what failed. You have two more attempts. Be smart with right. your. Well, because you guys said you also have your own test cases that are not part of the ones that students get. Yeah, right. right. So yeah. there, there is some reason why I might want to have more, more than one attempt for my official submission. Yeah. Yeah. We'll we'll get to those in the, in the policy. Thank you. That's basically experience, and this, so, so a couple of minor things is which we found particularly useful. So we had. We had dependencies between questions where basically you had to finish and get full grades on an early question before you could do a later question. And you could kind of, there's sort of pedagogical reasons you could have for this. Like there, there are concepts you learn earlier on that we say, okay, you, you have to understand this question to really understand this other question. And maybe even, you know, you have a later question that you couldn't principle brute force without understanding and so you, you force them to do the first one. But there's also technical reasons, which was basically we'd often have things like implement this algorithm and then later on we would use an implement heuristic that uses this algorithm. And what it used to do is when it was just running on the server, we could use the correct algorithm to test that question. But we can, if we just gave them the code, that would obviously be. So basically, we, we test to see their implementation is correct. And when we know it's correct, it's as good as having the gold implementations. We then use their one to test their heuristic. So that was sort of an interesting thing, interesting um, technical solution we came across. Um, if there are, then the students' code is implemented. That. So we have sort of timeouts for each question, and if they run over the time, then it fails at this time on. So if they write, sometimes they do write very slow code. So, so um, like the first algorithm, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure if that ever happened or no one complained about it. But yeah. right. Although, I mean, ideally, that'd be the sort of case where we really want to add a question to the previous, and yeah. we'll figure out at that time that you know, did you happen. implement this correctly. Or is it? Yeah, you would probably want to have, and even if it's just like a timing question, you would time it on a sufficiently big problem that it's going to fail earlier. Um, the final thing we had was that basically we were worried that students are running this auto grade, they get so used to running it that they just forget to submit it. They're like, we think okay. that they submitted it by running on the command line. And so we were worried, you know, trying to think how to solve this. And then we had the simplest possible solution so we're just going to print out a disclaimer at the end of every run, we're basically saying, your grades are not yet registered. To register your grades, you must submit. The grades you obtained through the website are your final grades, unless your submission is not in the spirit of the course, such as if your submission is simply hard-coded by unsuccessful tests. We will screen for this after the deadline. Um, so this is sort of achieving two goals at once here. And we're going to say it worked, because never issued this submitted. Or it didn't fail. Um, yeah, so that's about everything on the student side thing. So, Move on to. Okay. This is an AI class. Right. Um, did you try any AI techniques? Um. <laughs> For example, the classic thing was providing explanations. Yeah. And we. That. Yeah, that would that would be very cool. But we had enough work getting it to actually make the framework. But I think that would be that would be pretty fun. So you could have a, like much more adaptive some kind of explanation. Follow-up question. So when you talk about, as you find new common failure modes that the students make, and then you try to incorporate those into your test set, has there been any thought about trying to automate any part of that? Like just, you know, looking at syntactic or syntax tree similarity between students and saying, aha, here's a group of students that apparently did something structurally similar and they all got it wrong. And you essentially try to automatically extract new student failure modes from the work assignments themselves. No, but that sounds cool. 
Okay, because I, I would like to do that, so yeah. if you guys are interested in doing that. Uh, yeah, we, we haven't done that. We'll talk about one thing in the next part that could tie in with that. Somewhere doing that. There's what? There's been some Well, but people have done it to look for cheating, right? People have done it to look for common errors, right? Yeah, it's so it's used to look for common errors and suggest why. I have an explanation. Just there was one example um, of a working paper right now where they figured out um, they kind of did like clustering of all the errors people made. They, re they realized that people were reversing two lines of the algorithm, mm -hmm. and that's why they're getting the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. and they were able to then make a that really carefully at your code. Maybe you've got some two lines. lines. Yeah, you know, it's really it's yeah. not just the code, it's the switch, but the, the algorithm was switched. Yeah. yeah. And uh, there are definitely bugs like that where, where people put the code in the wrong place, but we just tend to figure them out by hand. So that would be definitely a nice. All right, great. So now that we've sort of talked about the, the pedagogical goals that we had and the, how the students experience the auto grader, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the staff experiences and interacts with the auto um, So the first thing that I want to talk about here is where the solutions come from. Uh, because we generally generate the test cases by hand, but in some cases producing a, a corresponding solution by hand would really be prohibitively difficult and or error prone. Uh, so what we actually do is maintain a staff reference implementation. Um, and then inside of that, we'll sort of delineate various portions of the code with like hashtag solution um, comments, and then actually run a preprocessor that will strip those parts out and insert like a comment that says, you know, your code here into what the students do. Um, and so you know that's kind of nice because at least it gives us some assurance that it's it's possible for them to you know, solve the problems that we've given. Uh, and additionally, we actually don't just maintain a correct reference implementation; we actually maintain a couple buggy implementations as well that have a couple like common student errors in it. That's one way that when a student runs something, we're able to say, you know, oh, your, your behavior, your output is consistent with having like partial fly bug. Um, and so, you know, you might, that might be one thing that you want to check for. Um, right, and then actually as, as part of the uh, infrastructure, the auto grader actually includes a like dash dash generate solutions plan, which will take whatever implementation you are running with and actually generate solution files, assuming that's correct. Um, if students were to try and use this, which they could, it's, it's in the code that they receive, then um, they would just overwrite their solution files with nothing. <laughs> and ironically, the, the next time they ran it, they'd probably get full credit because the solution files would be empty and so they're out. Um, nobody posted, though, that they actually tried that, so we're assuming they realized that it wasn't that, uh, that night. Um, Right, so there were some questions earlier about how we handle the possibility for people to hard code answers. And so uh, the way that we actually address that, yeah, is sort of with this, this shadow test suite, uh, which actually is, is pretty simple in principle, but it turns out to be a little trickier to realize in practice. Because the idea is that um, you want to have a test suite that you release and run publicly and will fully test students' code. And if they have implemented the solutions in good faith, then when they run it on an additional set of tests that is equivalent, meaning any code that passes the first set will pass the second set or fails the first set will fail the second set, um, the performance should be the same. And clearly, you know, if you pass the public set but fail the private set, then it's a little suspicious. So uh, the way that we actually do this is that when we write a test case, we also, for each test case, write some notion of what it means to generate a private test from this test case. And so what that means can vary a little bit from one question to the next. So uh, one, way that, one way that's very easy to do that um, is, you know, in our context, there was frequently um, some randomness in the problems. So we would use a different random seed. Um, and so, you know, presumably if it ran one way with, you know, one seed, it should also be able to solve the problem with a different seed as well. Um, another trick that we would do is sometimes rotating the game. Board. So if you had simply hard-coded that Pac-Man should go up, up, and to the right, once we rotate the game board, you know, that will not work. Um, right, and actually, actually, the the largest challenge that we found with this approach was that it's actually surprisingly hard or non-trivial at first pass to get test suites that are actually equivalent. 
it is easier than you might think to create situations where something will pass on one set and fail on the other. Um, and in particular, um, Nick mentioned a policy earlier about you know whatever grade you get on the public suite is the grade you get. And so that means that sometimes students will pass the public suite, fail the private suite, will look at their code, see that they didn't cheat, and then realize that there was basically a hole in the public test suite that they managed to jump through. <laughs> and so that's not great, but the way that we, the policy that we chose to handle that, which is what made this auto grader work, this policy decision was really a key part of the overall technical program, was that in that case, we don't tell the student and the implementation is regarded as cool. Um, Right. So in the event that there is a mismatch, we actually, the, the course staff receives an automated email generated by the grading servers. So it gives us this sort of mismatch report. So it will tell us the student's um, hash username. So edX will, will give us a lookup table where we can look up their true username for the local students. Uh, but then we'll also tell us sort of which questions there was a difference on and put a, you know, a nice syntax highlighted version of their code in the email. So based on this, we can look at it and say, oh, OK, you know, I see things were a bit different here on question four. So then you can scroll down and look at the code that related to question four. And you can normally tell you know, whether they've clearly done something that is um, you know, not in the spirit of the assignment or whether this looks like you know, an error. Uh, so right, so this, is, this is the approach that we take to, uh, to catching dishonesty that is sort of an inherent risk with so opening. So these go to the instructors, not not to the students immediately, right? Like, do right. you guys these, manually inspect these to see what the mismatches are? Yes, yes. These go to the instructors, um, and we've actually we have not publicly told the students that there is this shadow test suite that they're running against. Um, as far as they know, it's the exact same thing, and their grade is determined solely by the public test suite. Works for the NSA, can work for you. There you go. <laughs> um, You mean like if there's if they're missing a um, like in this case if supposing that this student was honest right and and we see that they passed something here but failed it here this is the situation you're asking about so actually in this case what we would do is make a note of it and you know address it well, either if this happened locally we can address it when we release the project um, on on the edX global course but it's only in future editions right and the Right, and the motivation for that is actually fairness to the student. That we feel once we've given them a test suite, maybe they, you know, were managing their time, they figured I finished this project, it would feel a bit unfair to us be, for us to be like, oh, actually, here are these new test cases that you failed, you know? Go back and spend more time on your project. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the part of the compromise we made in designing the system. All right, so um, one, right, so sort of moving, moving on from um, how, the, how the grades are, are calculated and all that. Um, one other part that we found was very uh, exciting that comes with running a global course is that sometimes your auto graders crash while you're asleep and while the entire course staff is asleep, but not everyone in your course is asleep. And so that, that can be problematic. Uh, and so the formerly, um, if there were any uncaught errors, the grader would just stop. We actually came to the realization that really most of the errors that we encountered, the correct action was just to restart the grader. So what we ended up doing was putting the entire thing in basically, you know, a big try catch block. <laughs> <laughs> and we we catch. I mean, there are certain things, right? There are certain you know, exceptional conditions that you see coming and the correct behavior, you know, it's, it's very clear how you should handle it. So that you can handle sort of before you percolate up to the big try catch block. Uh, but once you get up there, in the event that, you know, something bad has happened, we handle that just by sending an email alert to the staff, uh, which goes out from the grading server and tells us what the error was. And then a minute later, it will try and restart the grading. And it will do that for some, like, maximum number of restart attempts. Uh, this, this here, in this case, it looked like, you know, some disk filled up on the grader, so that's not something that can be addressed by just restarting it, but a lot of times it's some sort of transient network error or something. Oh, I, yeah. um, I guess it's tangential, but do you guys also essentially keep copies forever of the student's submissions? Yes. So that you can do after the fact analysis? And yes, we do. And actually, I mean, the designing these was 
a software engineering exercise in many respects. Because uh, one thing that was very helpful was the ability to do like regression testing against previous submissions, which sometimes it was a little tricky because since we had improved the quality and coverage of the test suite in some cases, it meant that sometimes something that used to be correct would now fail our test suite. And that could mean that the test suite's buggy or that the old code is buggy. But um, it does let you test properties like do the private grade and the public grade match. Mm -hmm. That should always be true. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, another thing that's, that's really helped us out I, in terms of managing resources is maintaining a sort of a status and monitoring page for the graders. Um, so, you know, as, as Nick mentioned, as the deadline is approaching, uh, particularly for more computationally intensive projects, the queue for grading can begin to mount up. Um, and so, you know, one way to ease that is to, to bring up more machines, but you don't want to run them all the time. So we actually, we had this uh, infrastructure set up where each machine would record basically its, its pending workload and how long various jobs it had gotten had been in the queue. Um, and so we would show a full version of that to the staff and let us see all the machines individually, kind of a scaled down version publicly, give students a feel for, you know, this is the average time it's going to take for your, you know, official grade to pop out. Um, Right, you know, this is about how many people are in line from it. All right, so that kind of wraps up the staff point of view. Uh, so I just want to share a couple of comments now about uh, various different challenges with this approach and uh, ongoing <coughs> and future work that, that could be done to this auto grading system. So I think definitely the, the biggest challenge that we found in having students do local auto grading was getting the code to actually execute the same on their machine and on our machines. Um, you would hope that using, you know, Python or some sort of interpreted language that it would go relatively smoothly. <laughs> but, you know, it turns out there are still differences. Um, I think probably the most frustrating one we found was that there's a couple places where the random number generator had been seeded with a string. And it turns out that that's actually not a platform independent operation. Uh, because Python hashes the string and hashing is not a platform. Um, so that one took us a while to find. It's pretty profound. Yes, yeah, we have to dig wow. for a while. And you, and you get into sort of weird situations where you're asking students, you know, could you please come to office hours because I really need to observe the execution of your code <laughs> because you have this rare bug and we would like to find it before it's released globally. We really need you. Um, there are even cases where they're running the same Linux, the same Python version. Different random numbers. Yeah. So that was. Yeah. So it can be. It, this, this is. This was definitely the largest challenge and biggest headache we faced. Um, one potential workaround would be to give students VMs and say, you know, this VM is the supported environment. That's when you, you leave the supported environment, hey, it's the wild west. You know, all bets are yeah. off. That's that's what we, even for our on-campus class we have to do that now because okay. we ended up like. We would blow like two weeks trying to get everybody's machine to kind of work, and yeah. this is the law now. That's interesting. Well, so we, we, um, it seems I, I wouldn't be surprised if in software engineering, you have, for 169, you have a, a larger software stack than we're dealing with. So I could definitely large. believe that problem is worse for you than it is for us. That's, I think you've gone so far as saying basically, if you're not running VM, don't come to us for Right, yeah. and we've said that since last year. Yeah. In fact, we, we've even also said that. The behavior of the auto graders in the test cases on the VM is the behavior by which you'll be graded. So you know, don't don't plan on saying, "Well, I, I ran these tests and they passed on platform food." Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So I mean, the the I guess the the drawbacks that kept us from that was the part that you know there'd be a little bit of additional overhead for the students in installing the VM, uh, but also I mean the the grading servers are definitely going to run Linux, um, and because we had students from a range of backgrounds. I think software engineering, you, you definitely want to be comfortable in Linux. Unix is the pre yeah, <laughs> Yes, it is. It is. Um, but you know, for, for some of the students, um, they, they were having trouble like running Hello World in Windows with Python. Um, and so, right, so this lets them sort of stay in, in an environment where they may be. Um, right, a couple other things. Uh, occasionally, it will turn out that a project gets released, and for whatever reason, afterwards, we want to make some 
you know, maybe it turns out that we that some students have said, you know, oh, I pass all the you know easy test cases, meaning like small very modular test cases. But when you try and run into this huge Pac-Man game with like you know three ghosts and a bunch of walls and power pellets and stuff, you know, it fails in step 89, and I don't know why. Um, and I you know haven't slept for three days. So um, right, so those are cases where we want to release a new new test case. So this is actually something that the ongo or the uh, current GSIs are working. And so I think the way they've built it is that um, whenever you run the autograder locally, it does a, uh, a network request and pulls down um, like a, a pickled Python dictionary that has a hash of each of the files that you should have. And it will compute the hash of the files that you have locally and check the hashes against the dictionary. And if something's out of sync, it will warn that you should update. A um, couple areas for future work. One that we talked about was you know, that this sort of approach where you're really giving students um, you know, very modular test cases or giving them a lot of guidance and tips about you, know, you might have problem X in your code um, doesn't do a ton to build their ability to write test cases. Um, you know, if you've never seen test cases before, this might be good so you understand them. But so one, one thing we thought about was potentially having a design in the future where maybe part of the assignment is that students have to submit test cases. And you could imagine creating an infrastructure where you run student test cases against a variety of reference implementations. And uh, like you know, in the event that it passes against all of them um, or fails in the event you know, that it should fail, then it goes into a um, goes into like a public test repository. And that becomes you know, what you're using for the test. And so that's kind of cool because it causes students to contribute. Um, I mean, you could also imagine maybe some sort of infrastructures where you reward students who somehow produce clever test cases for some definition of clever, where you know things that pass many other things for some reason fail theirs, and it's not because their test was wrong, but you know they found a, a tricky edge case. Um, another thing that we've talked about uh, is anonymous usage reports, and um, so this is part of what I was thinking. You know, ties into the ideas about catching students. So you could imagine a system. Happy birthday! Let's continue. <laughs> I, I had that happen once myself. I hate it. <laughs> All right. Um, right. Anyway, so you could also imagine doing anonymous use reports, where uh, maybe every time the student runs the auto grader locally, it sends some anonymous data about how that went. So it says, you know, basically gives you a feel for this is how far along they are in the project. You know, this is the wrong answer that they produced to this particular test case. Um, you can even think about hypothetically including their code, um, which, you know, in a lot of cases, sometimes when students had rare bugs, the hardest thing was to get their code from them so that we could reproduce the bug. Um, you could hypothetically do that. I think. The reason we were a little bit gun shy about that was because their code had to go through the edX system for it to be officially graded and reported. And the most foolproof way we were aware of to get it into the edX system was having them. And right, if we broke the part that like submits their code to edX, that would be a showstopper. So um, right. Uh, right, and I mean, then there's like, Moon also had to work out security things with authentication, right? And so, yeah, so that I totally agree. We sidestepped it. All right, so just to sort of wrap things up here and take any uh, you know, last minute questions. Um, right, so our experience overall was that local grading uh, tends to improve the student experience for a couple reasons. One is grading transparency. Um, you know, students don't like being told that. They failed test three, whatever that was. <laughs> you know, good luck fixing it. Um, also, this incidentally, kind of like when you open source software, improved the quality of our test suite in some cases. Because we actually, at one point, um, since you're at the risk of a little bit of embarrassment for the core staff, we had a student email us and say, you know, I'm pretty sure it is mathematically impossible to pass test three. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of we, we looked at it and we realized, yup, you are correct. Um, you know, there was a little bit of a of a mistake here in um, in how we had basically unrolled the test case from from 
previous test, we, you know, we said, you know, okay, good, very good point. We will fix that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yes, I mean, there's actually numerous advantages that came with the increased transfer. Um, I think, you know, it also helps students to have a faster development process and to not have to spend as much time digging deep into, you know, what was otherwise a pretty big code base, although they did get the satisfaction of seeing their code run in this kind of cool system of Pac-Man that, you know, otherwise includes some, some code that's difficult to interact with. Um, we definitely observed that students submitted to edX less. So most students submitted code for each project one to two times. Um, there always seemed to be, like, one student who didn't really believe us when we told them that it was the same locally and on their machine would submit it like 120 times or something. But um, most students just once or twice. Um, and actually, in the, in the past, it's been about 10 to 20 times per student. So that was a big problem. Um, and then lastly, uh, we're, we're told, um, I'm not personally familiar with this, but we're told that you know, other schools that use the Pac-Man labs for their local AI classes um, have, have adopted the auto grader in this version of it as well. So it seems to be working well enough for them there. Yeah, so I think Nick and I are thrilled to have it presented here, and we'd love to take any more questions. Yeah? On an earlier slide, you said something about the operator working on other applications. So the, we haven't we haven't used this auto grader with other sets of labs. But in principle, the structure of the auto grader is that you define some test case directory. And then within each of, within that directory, there's several subdirectories with one corresponding to each question or each part of your lab. Uh, and then sort of a config file explains how many points each of those questions is worth. And then within each of those subdirectories, there's another config file and a series of dot test and dot solution. And that, those dot .test and dot .solution files are what make up a question, and that config file defines the semantics for combining the results. So in some cases, for some questions, you might be allowed partial credit. So if you pass three out of five tests, you get three out of five points for that question. Generally, we went with something that was a bit simpler, which was just that you needed to pass all of the tests, and then you got all of the points. And otherwise, you got nothing. Um, so in principle, the structure of that is totally independent of so you, so you don't really depend on the No. No, I mean, the, so the, the way that you generate the private test, um, the private test cases, that is somewhat integrated with the actual problems that you're solving. So like in our case, part of how we did that was by rotating the board. You know, clearly that doesn't work in the absence of a board. But it's probably a practice. Yes, I mean you want to have you want to have some measure of parity between the even and odd test cases because you want the same outcome for both. Of them. Um, right. And and we, we did have for for implementing search algorithms and other things we would have simple just graphs that they would search on that are not two dimensional they just have some abstract structure and then the notion of changing that to we have like a different notion of creating a private version of that. And so that would, those were exactly the test cases that are making sure, you know, you only, you don't just work on Pac-Man, you can work on any kind of state space. Um. Chris, I want to say, when I was a data scientist, I had a lot of different in Japan. Um, the, the huge problem was not, not because there were Massive um, cascading failure. People getting the first floor. This definitely would have been a better approach. And um, the other thing I wanted to remark on was just that, like, the amount of feedback you get on the test is absolutely phenomenal. Like, I think if you gave your assignments to professional software developers. So they didn't have the iteration. Yeah, you don't have to. They don't have to use it. Have it in various combinations. I kind of 
kind of wonder, like, is there application in this software? Mm -hmm. Make some assignment where you're modifying an open source project and you can design test cases for it, which end up like. Yeah, we can like maybe something Well, I mean, at a minimum, you could imagine, you know, if you had the luxury of having, you know, three teams who could all do the same thing and you didn't like care about that. Yeah, right. Then you could you could have them each, you know, write a solution and instead of test cases, and, they, and at the end you can find all the test cases, but they don't see the other ones. I think this is an area of research crowdsourcing the beginning or perhaps our supports our team. So we have a formal verification team. I do want to do this. Experimenting is crowdsourcing the beginning. Give some program online. Taking uh, suggestions and uh, favor. So this is this is the things and all that. Is there a question in the back? Oh. Cool. Thank you, guys. Right. Thank you.